I'm excited to describe my research paper titled Discrete Personalized Pricing. To help frame my paper, note that over the last 20 years, a number of novel data sets have emerged that reveal quite a bit about consumers' habits and tastes. Examples include web browsing histories, prior purchase histories, and geolocation data. Perhaps, unsurprisingly, these data have been found to be much more useful than basic demographics are for personalized pricing, as I and others have found. Price discrimination no longer needs to be as simple as student discounts or senior discounts. Now there is a wealth of information at firms' disposal to set online prices that are truly personalized in order to extract more profits from consumers. However, common wisdom suggests that goods are still sold via posted prices, and most economists agree. In my research, I challenge this assumption. Specifically, I investigate a method for disguising personalized pricing as dynamic pricing, which firms may already be using. One might ask, why would firms disguise personalized pricing? One reason is a concern about a consumer backlash. There's a well-known example of Amazon setting prices that were perceived to have been personalized in the year 2000, leading to negative publicity. Amazon promised never to do so again. More recently, Lena Khan, who is the chairperson of the FTC, noted the question of how to implement personalized pricing without incurring a major backlash was a major topic of discussion at the 2014 National Retail Association Annual Convention. Firms might also want to hide personalized pricing to avoid regulatory scrutiny. Policymakers have scrutinized the practice in the US and outlawed the practice in China. In Europe, the legality is less clear under the general data protection regulations. One might ask, if firms want to disguise personalized pricing, how might they do so? Existing papers found platforms sometimes personalize search rankings by showing more expensive items to price insensitive consumers. While prices are not technically personalized in this example, personalized search ranking will require more effort from such consumers to find the lower priced options, and in effect pushes some consumers to buy more expensive items. Another way to disguise personalized pricing is to label it as something else, such as a coupon or discount, which is either automatically applied or requires trivial amounts of effort, such as clicking on a box at Amazon. This is simply a change in how personalized pricing is framed. Note that these methods seem to be used already, but may not be that effective at either raising profits or at disguising the true intention to personalize prices. I investigate another alternative. The basic idea is to change the posted price just as a new customer is arriving at the website. Specifically, when the customer sends the request for the website, and includes revealing information like web cookies, uh, prior search histories, other things like that, the firm could change the posted price at that moment, tailoring it to the arriving consumer just before sending the data constituting the website to this new arrival. To avoid detection, the firm would privately commit to not changing price for some length of time. So any consumer arriving shortly thereafter sees the same price. In sum, the method personalizes the price based on the identity of the consumer that happens to arrive at that point, but it is disguised to appear as traditional dynamic pricing. Note that this method of pricing might arise unintentionally. Suppose the firm uses all data at its disposal to set the posted price to maximize profits using some off-the-shelf machine learning method. But it prevents the price from changing too frequently. If, if the data used include the identity of the arriving consumer, then this should yield equivalent outcomes to the model that I am proposing. One might ask whether this method would successfully disguise personalized pricing. I believe the answer is an emphatic yes. Note that consumers typically discover personalized pricing when multiple consumers find that they are being offered different prices at the same time. Because the firm has privately committed to keeping prices fixed for some period in this method I'm proposing, consumers would see the same price 
at least most of the time. Note that researchers have used analogous methods, often with spoof consumers, to test for personalized pricing. So they too would be deceived. Also note that researchers intentionally use short lags between price checks to rule out another reason for price changes, dynamic pricing. Dynamic pricing, which occurs for a variety of reasons, is well tolerated by consumers. In fact, that is the intention of this pricing technique, to disguise personalized pricing as dynamic pricing. If such pricing is indeed being used, then it has large implications for the economics literature. Economic models make assumptions about how goods are transacted in the market. Falsely assuming that prices are not personalized leads to biased estimates of demand and inflation and misleading relationships between market concentration and firm profits. Thus, the implications extend well beyond the narrow field of price discrimination. The results are also likely of interest to online platforms as well as consumers who apparently despise personalized pricing and likely would be upset to learn that it is being used. In the remainder of this talk, I am going to describe how firms can optimally implement disguised personalized pricing, then apply it to several contexts to shed light on its impacts on consumers and the market. Now let me describe the model setup. Myopic consumers are assumed to arrive randomly over time. We could relax these assumptions, but the main findings of the model should carry through. The firm observes the consumer's type before choosing the new posted price. If the price changes, then the firm privately commits to keeping the price the same for some length of time, implying any subsequent consumers arriving shortly thereafter would see the same price. I'll skip over some of the more technical details and just refer anyone interested to the actual paper. Essentially, the model determines the optimal price to charge the arriving consumer, balancing the profit gained from the new arrival against the reduction in profits to subsequent arrivals during the fixed price period. That price which was targeted to the arriving consumer was personalized to that consumer and therefore is not well suited to extracting profits from subsequent arrivals. This trade-off will depend on a couple important relevant factors. The first is the number of consumers who are expected to arrive during the period while price is locked. If only a few, then there's not much of an implicit cost of targeting the price to the arriving consumer. However, if a lot of consumers are expected to arrive during this fixed price period, then tailoring the price to the arriving consumer is going to substantially lower profits from the many subsequent consumers arriving while price is fixed. The second relevant factor is the precision of estimated willingness to pay. If the firm knows precisely the willingness to pay of the arriving consumer, then static profit gains from targeting price is high, more likely offsetting losses from subsequent consumers offered a suboptimal price. I'll come back to these relevant factors later. I next investigate the outcomes from such price discrimination. To do so, I need to make some assumptions about the distribution of demand functions across consumers, as well as the consumer arrival rate, which is another name for the popularity of the item. I consider four distributions of valuations across consumers. The first is an empirical distribution from an earlier paper of mine, which estimated individual level demand for Netflix based on their web browsing histories. I also consider three theoretical distributions of consumer valuations, the uniform, the normal, and the exponential. The reason that I consider several distributions is to analyze whether findings are generalizable. For each distribution and each consumer arrival rate, I simulate prices uh, and profits through the following method. I start by approximating the value function through value function iteration. I then calculate the policy function and simulate prices for a long random path of consumer arrivals. The first set of results relate to profits. This figure shows four similar plots. Each relates the change of profits on the vertical axis to the consumer arrival rate on the horizontal axis. The plots differ along two dimensions. The top row shows a percent change in profits on the vertical axis, and the bottom row shows the absolute 
change in profits. The left column shows a change in profits for the empirical distribution of individual level demand functions, which was for Netflix, and the right column shows it for the three theoretical distributions. We can see in the top row that as the arrival rate increases, the profits measured in percentage terms decline. That is, this strategy raises profits in percentage terms the most for unpopular items. This is intuitive and expected. If you look at the bottom row, however, a more surprising result is apparent. There is an inverted U-shaped pattern between the change in profits and the consumer arrival rate. This implies that the strategy is not most profitable for low popularity items, but rather yields the largest gains from medium popularity products. This surprising result is due to two competing factors. As the popularity increases, the profit gain per consumer falls. However, the strategy is applied to more consumers. Initially, the latter effect, that is more consumers to apply the strategy to, dominates. That is, a smaller gain per consumer from more consumers yields a larger total increase in profits when added up across the many more consumers. However, this pattern later reverses and eventually the firm foregoes personalizing prices altogether, leading to the inverted U-shape. In this next figure, I show this a similar plot depicting the change in profits against the consumer arrival rate for the uniform distribution. However, in this graph, I vary the precision of the firm's estimate of the consumer's willingness to pay. Each curve on the graph denotes the relationship between profit gains and the consumer arrival rate for a given amount of uncertainty in the firm's estimate of a consumer's willingness to pay. The light green curve with triangles shows the relationship between profits and the consumer arrival rate when there is no uncertainty. You can see that the increase in profits is highest for relatively popular products in this case, roughly 3,000 consumers expected to arrive during the fixed price period, which may last something like an hour or a day. This seems like a lot of consumers. It is more than the daily U.S. sales of the 10th highest selling book. Thus, the strategy may be applicable even for some of the best selling items. These findings also suggest that as firms acquire better data, allowing better predictions of willingness to pay, that this strategy will become more profitable and the popularity where gains are highest will increase. We should expect it to be used for the majority of products if it is not already today. Next, let's look at the extent of price discrimination. First is measured by the range of prices across consumers. The graph on the left shows the markup offered to a given consumer on the vertical axis against the consumer's type on the horizontal axis. Each curve shows the relationship between markup and consumer type for a given consumer arrival rate. The light green line shows the relationship for a relatively low consumer arrival rate, about a one in a hundred chance that a consumer arrives during the fixed price period. You can see that there's quite a large range of targeted markups offered across different consumer types. For higher arrival rates, the markup range across consumers, the slope of the line, is less steep. This result is intuitive. However, it is not how the extent of price discrimination is typically analyzed. Analyzing it this way would require see what price each consumer is offered. A more common way to measure the extent of price discrimination, and arguably a more revealing way, is to look at the amount of price variation over a given time interval. In this next set of graphs, I relate the price range over some fixed interval to popularity. You can see for both the empirical distribution on the left and the theoretical distributions on the right, an obvious inverted U-shaped pattern, implying the price range offered to different consumers over time is largest for products of medium popularity. This was surprising to me, as I would have thought that the extent of price discrimination declined monotonically in popularity. However, model simulations show that is not the case. The reason for the observed pattern is that as popularity increases, there is less tailoring of price to a given consumer arrival, but more consumers to apply the strategy to. Basically, more price draws from a narrower range of prices. Initially, the latter effect dominates and the price range increases with the consumer arrival rate. 
Eventually, however, the firm foregoes targeting altogether. There is too high of an implied cost from deviating from the standard price for the many consumers expected to arrive while price is fixed. Overall, these findings imply that the impacts of this strategy are not primarily for unpopular products, but rather have the largest impacts for fairly popular products. In conclusion, a number of papers have shown that big data reveals a lot of information about consumers and would seem to enable profitable personalized pricing. However, we know that firms are concerned about consumer backlash and policy scrutiny. Disguising personalized pricing, uh, the strategy as I described, therefore seems an enticing strategy for a wide range of product popularities. After all, if firms can raise profits through targeted pricing while keeping consumers, regulators, and competitors unaware, why wouldn't they do that? Relatedly, absent regulations, why would we assume that firms are not personalizing prices in a disguised manner?